So some people are, are joining in and they made dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at a vampire festival, I wonder what dinner is, Jeff. <laughs> I can watch it down with. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, seven thirty-one. So maybe we get started. Maybe people drop in and uh, you know come in, come in later. We have a few people um, here to begin. So um, for those of you who uh, weren't here this morning, we we opened the day. Um, with with an interview with Michael Arnzen and and me, and um, we're going to end the day with a reading by Michael Arnzen. So, um, in case you didn't happen to hear all the wonderful things about him this morning, uh, that uh, I'll just give you a little a little bio on on uh, who he is for those who don't know him, which I, I don't imagine there are many people who don't know who you are. Um, but uh, I I here's something I learned right. I was just sort of uh, going over some material to see if. What am I missing or whatever? But uh, anyway, so he teaches at, at Seton Hill uh, University in the fiction program. But I learned that you started there in 1999. And if that's correct, that's the exact same year I started at, at State College of Florida. So we started yeah. teaching careers at the same time, which is, uh, <laughs> but he has won numerous Bram Stoker awards, um, including for the novel Grave Markings. Um, but he's well rounded in terms of uh, the things that he publishes a newsletter, core letter. Um, poetry, freaks events, and also nonfiction in, uh, you know, in the horror genre. And he also has an imprint, Mastication Publications, and he's the recipient of an International Horror Guild Award. Um, so I, you know, again, just like to throw my thank you out to the International Vampire Film and Arts Festival uh, for allowing State College of Florida to, to host this and the Literary Guild uh, of State College of Florida in particular. Um, to host the conference. And we're really pleased to have uh, Michael Arnzen here. He, he's actually been to our college in Florida um, a couple of times. And um, so now we have the opportunity for a, a wide audience of people all over the world to hear his words. So without me taking up any more time, I'll let, uh, I'll let Michael take over. Wow, it's been a long time, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, welcome everybody who's come out tonight to listen to some vampire fiction. Um, you know, and uh, just you know, as a preamble again, uh, thank you to uh, the conference for inviting me to be a part of it once again. Uh, working through Seton Hill University and our MFA program in writing popular fiction, uh, we sponsored uh, the academic uh, track of the conference in Transylvania uh, for two years in a row, a couple of years ago. Uh, and now State College of Florida is doing it and they're doing a great job. So tune in again tomorrow for more if, you're, <laughs> if you've got the stamina. Uh, but my intent is to slay you right now with some <laughs> short fiction and poetry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought I, uh, since it's a vampire conference, uh, I'd, li I'd like to read vampire oriented work. So I just kind of went through all my old archives, pulled out some micro fiction, some poetry, and actually a recent short story that I published that I thought I'd, I'd share an excerpt from with you today, tonight. Um, and um, I don't, I'm not really here to pitch a new book or anything like that. I just wanted to you know, live the spirit through creative writing. So I'm just gonna start reading things right now. Um, this first piece is a, is a micro fiction. It's like a paragraph and a half long. Uh, and it's a short, short, called Beyond Undead. And this is a, actually a film was made out of this piece. So uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, the story appears in my collection, 100 Jolts. Beyond Undead. The stake plunged into his chest and his life flashed before his eyes. The warm gleam in his mother and father's eyes reflected in the cold eyes of the vampirus who'd created him. The liquid slide of his first warm kiss, as slick as the bloody underside of flesh between his lips from his last kill. Everything that he loved, he murdered with hatred's hunger. Death became his life. This was the torture of being undead. His life flashed before his eyes. So did his death over and again, unending. This was the torture 
of his own death. Uh, this next piece is a poem, uh, kind of a throwback to the 60s. <laughs> it's called Curse of the Empire. Hippie vampires look the worst because they refuse to Lugosi their hair back with pomade. They sit cross-legged beside their broken coffins and tie-dye their funeral garb into spirographic florals of mold and mud, tripping on homegrown shock-white graveyard mushrooms, believing they're good vegetarians until the thirst for human blood animates their groovy shambling. And like stoned out stone cold soldiers, they hunt hungry for a feast of friends. Make blood not war, some cry, and they bite man in the spirit of free love. Their undead heads slurping in shadows that no longer see summer or sunshine anymore, forever young. Uh, here's another one from 100 Jolts, a very short piece. It's called Crusty Old Age. Before dawn, an old woman forks holes into a flaky pie crust, cooling down the steaming tin on her windowsill. Outside, a lurking vampire responds. In a burst of blackened dust, he transforms into a cloud of fruit flies and drifts into her opened window. Absent-mindedly, she swats as he resumes shape. She tastes of lilac as he bites a frail, feckled, freckled shoulder, but her runny tissue is warm over his tongue like baked fruit. She, too, will develop a taste for human pie baked by time. Brittle bones and dentures won't prevent her. She knows how to use a fork. I'll read one more of these weird little ditties. <laughs> and then uh, an excerpt from a longer story. Uh, this, uh, I believe, appears in 100 Jolts as well. It's called Anniversary Meal. It's a vampire mood piece. <laughs> I dare to show her my forgetfulness. What anniversary is this again, I ask. She plays with her food a bit, refusing to look up at me from the dining table. The trappings of our romantic dinner seem to mock me. The room turns so quiet, I can hear the flutter of the candelabra's flames and the subtle sigh of her flaring nostrils. She cuts meat and the knife squeaks awkwardly against bone. Then she rolls an eye up at me, just one, Sixth, ah yes, I say before she sticks her tongue against her teeth to finish the word. Number six, her one eye ogles me with exasperation as she chews. I break eye contact to take a bite of my own meal. The meat is especially red and juicy as if I were stabbing and slicing a soaked sponge. It's hard to come up with something fresh to say after being together for so long. I love you, I muster, looking quickly over her hardened facial features. More than ever before, she smiles. I see meat fibers caught between her teeth. Six millennia, that's how long we've been together. The love of fresh marinated muscle never goes stale, but somehow our conversation does, especially when she doesn't mind her manners. She's old, yet still so uncultivated. The silverware isn't silver, I remind her as she clutches her knife. She cuts another slice and together for just a moment, we laugh. Here's an excerpt from a short story uh, called Catching Santa. And it's kind of a goofy story filled with uh, kind of tropes related to Christmas. So I apologize for that, but it was a fun story to write in that spirit. Uh, and it's about, um, a kid who wants to catch Santa Claus coming in through the fireplace, you know, coming down the chimney, coming inside. Instead of just leaving the milk and cookies out, he wants to catch Santa in the act of leaving his presents. But he's in for a big surprise because as he discovers the hard way, Santa is really a vampire. <laughs> Here's an excerpt from the story. 
It started with a loud scratching noise somewhere above the fireplace, a deep stone scraping sound like the house was literally itching itself. Mother's head shot up toward the ceiling as if she could see through it to detect the source of the sound. I hopped off her lap and walked toward the tree, wondering more about the presence than some stupid scuffle when I noticed the fire was sputtering. And that was because something was snuffing it out. Sooty dust was dropping down from inside the fireplace, muffling the log that had almost burned down to a little black cinder. I crouched down and tried to peer up the chimney while my mother walked over to join me. Huh? What's up there? I wondered aloud. I hope it's not those pesky bats again, she said. And then Santa's boots dropped down in front of us, calf-high, shiny leather, laced up tight beneath the red fabric of his pants. They stood stock still in flames as I stared in awe. A man who could only be Saint Nick contorted and revealed himself as he stepped up and out from our fireplace while my mother stood stunned beside where I was squatting and I leaned back on my hips. Merry Christmas, he chortled, but I quickly realized this was not the jolly fat man from my Christmas fantasies. He was slender and his outfit was as faded and filthy as a dish rag, missing buttons and stained with pink smeary clouds of God knows what. I could smell the burnt leather of his shoes, but stronger than that was the cloying odor of rancid meat that hung in the air around him as he looked furtively from me to my mother. I remember just blinking a lot as I gazed up at him before he relaxed a little and scanned around the room. His face was not hairy with a beard, but gaunt and yellow, and his eyes were as beady as a rat's. Santa had no flowing locks beneath his cap either, there were some white hair, but they looked more like oily cotton strings pulled down from his hat here and there than anything attached to a scalp. Who the hell are you, Mom finally asked, putting a hand on my shoulder to pull me back a little from this strange Santa. His head snapped toward her, but he only answered with a smile as his eyes seemed to become solid as porcelain in their sockets. I was a little mesmerized by how amazing those eyes looked till I was distracted by the glint of his teeth reflecting the blinking Christmas tree lights. That glint made them look sharp and long as a lion's as he towered over me, eyes locked on my mother. She dropped her coffee mug and it gurgled in itself empty on the floor by my foot. I pulled my attention away from Santa's fangs to look at my mother. She was stunned as she dropped her robe to the floor and started walking toward him. There before me and nothing but her underwear, my mother slowly marched toward him as if sleepwalking. And he opened his arms for what looked to, to me like a loving hug. Mom, I asked softly, but she kept walking and to my horror, he embraced her, pulling her flesh against his disgusting outfit. I noticed she lifted herself up a little bit on the balls of her feet as he clutched her his greenish gangly arms sliding down her waist, one hand going very low, broken claw nails dimpling into the cross-hatched pink underwear she wore. And then she leaned her head to one side as if baring her neck to him. Mom, I shouted, angry and wanting to do something, but somehow feeling like I was nailed to the floor as I crouched there on all fours. The ugly thing that was dressed as Santa Claus snarled over her shoulder at me, the top half of his mouth all teeth gleaming with wet shine, and while his eyes dared me to speak again, I knew he was getting ready to chomp into her neck. And then suddenly I heard Dad's loud footsteps bounding down the stairs. I turned my head to call out to him, but he was already zooming across the room and tackling Santa before I could even open my mouth. The two of them fell back into the pile of my gifts, squashing boxes and tearing open packages as their bodies twisted and pummeled at each other. Santa's hat caught on a limb, and I saw more of his ugly hair for a quick moment, just tufts of thin white sprouting from random patches on his scalp, like he'd been losing it in clumps for years. His bulbous head was as lumpen as a broken skull, and the flesh had that same greenish tinge as his arms. It flailed as he snarled and struggled with my father. Dad threw an elbow under his chin, and the thing's flesh made a mud-sliding sound in response, and I watched in terror as together they rolled against the Christmas tree. Needles showered down from above them, and as the glass ornaments rattled and the tree made reedy scratching sounds against my plan our paneling, I heard a crack, and then the tree's top snapped off the top and tumbled down. 
a chain light went out and it got a little darker in the room as my father yanked the cord from the socket and appeared to be trying to lasso Santa's squirmy hands in front of him. Suddenly my mother slumped to the floor and her head audibly knocked against her fallen coffee cup. I rushed to her and immediately realized she hadn't fainted, but something worse. She was out cold. I, uh, then her body began convulsing on the floor as if someone else were controlling it. Blood was pouring out from the place where her neck settled onto the torso, which was all gore. Santa had torn the muscles of her shoulder right off the bone when I had turned away to call my dad. Now there was only torn meat and exposed bone and blood, so much blood spreading and pooling on the floor to mix with her spilled coffee like some horrifying kind of creamer. <laughs> Stunned, I looked again toward the tree and saw that father had somehow gotten his hands on the fallen treetop, the hand carved cross that we had always used as the crowning glory of our decorated tree and held it aloft over the fiendish imitation of Santa Claus. Its long bottom was tapered to a sharp point. His other hand had the beast pinned to the floor by the neck as it writhed beneath his strong grip. Its arms were lashed with Christmas light rope and the green lines were actually steaming into his flesh to my surprise as were some of the broken ornaments that jounced around on his body. Then in a flash, my dad brought the long end of the wooden cross down into the creature's chest. It burst right through his ribs as easy as a pencil through paper, impaling all the way down to the cross's wide arms. There was more steam, a black smoke that rose from his wound. The creature went silent and stiff, and it was only in that silent moment when I, all I could hear was my father's heavy breathing, the hiss of the steam, and the blood trickling from my mother's throat that I realized Santa had been growling like a wildcat most of the time they'd been wrestling. I think I'm going to stop there. But there's much more than meets the eye. We discover in the story that the dad is actually kind of a vampire slayer and has been doing this for many years. Uh, and that the son, the kid, the narrator of the story, actually is responsible for, you know, letting the right one in by wishing Santa would come visit every year. So it's an interesting kind of structure, I think. And uh, if you want to read more of that story, uh, it's in a book that uh, kind of went under the radar called Collected, uh, Collected Horror Christmas Shorts, <laughs> Volume 2. It's, avail it's available on uh, Amazon.com. And it was edited by Kevin Kennedy, if you want to look for that book and find out more. Let's see, we got about 10 minutes left. I don't know if we want to do questions or I could read a couple more poems. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, it's whatever you're comfortable with. If, uh, if anyone has um, questions, um, you go ahead and type it into the chat and um, we can make sure that um, you know, Michael gets those and I can present him those questions or we can uh, continue reading. <laughs> or if you want to read and maybe the questions will come in. Okay, yeah, feel free to bring on the questions, folks. Uh, thanks for coming again. Uh, I'll, I'll just read a couple more poems, and uh, if you don't have any questions, that's fine. We'll just uh, peace out. But uh, <clears throat> I love sharing this stuff with you guys. Um, so the poem on the top of my stack here is kind of a romantic or erotic poem, I suppose, but it's kind of silly at the same time. Uh, <laughs> it's called Vampires and Perfume. Some vampires do wear cologne, gently spritzed around their macho gray shoulders and behind their greased back dead man's hair. It is not merely a lure to seduce the sentimental, but a gesture of kindness, a vapor to cling to while they nuzzle into the necks of their victims and tongue their torn jugulars, as well as a lingering odor after they transform and flit away. But these vampire men can never know and never will that the soily aroma of their omnipresent death can never truly be covered up by cloying oils and floral fragrance, or that the redolence of decay is precisely what makes them so fucking attractive. Some women like the exotic tinge of a man's dirt as much as a foreign accent and envy his immortal bond with earth. Some women like the smell of flesh, pure forever flesh, the smell of flesh that does not bleed. And these romantic vampire men 
understanding neither in nature nor women, and lusting for blood more than beauty, lick the bare canted necks of their paramours, remembering life as they savor the false flavor that these women spritz there too, before they bite into it, as if the finest perfume the world has to offer is simply seasoning. <laughs> so we had we did have um, one. Craig Craig wants to know the title of the last piece. Was that um, Catching Santa? Yeah, Catching Santa is the title of it. It's a short story. Again, it, it appears in Collected Horror Christmas Shorts, Volume Two. Volume oh, Two. Like Kevin Kennedy. <laughs> it's hard to find. So, <laughs> uh, what is it? I love the Volume Two. I, I guess I have a question. I noticed that um, you know a number of your pieces involve. I guess you would call it humor. I mean, I'm saying humor because it's, you know, kind of gristly and dark and, and um, yeah, you know, and graphic, but yet there's this sort of humorous edge to stuff. Is that, would you say that characterizes most of your work or what percentage do you think you employ humor? Hmm. <laughs> well, I can't quantify it into a percentage, <laughs> but uh, I can say that, you know, I, I often, see a lot of the ideas that I have as preposterous and absurd. You know, I'm not like one of these horror writers who actually worship Satan or <laughs> practices witchcraft or, you know, goes ghost hunting. I'm kind of a diehard skeptic. Uh, so um, I, I want to believe Jeff, but <laughs> so I think that's the issue is that I, I'm skeptical in the belief, um, the value, the truth value of what I'm saying. Um, and yet, I, uh, I believe there's the, an emotional truth that these stories still can get at. Um, and sometimes it's just in the language as opposed to the plot. Um, and, you know, uh, to me, writing it should be fun. It should be kind of a field of play. And, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek. Uh, it's all make believe, you know. I know that. I think I want to acknowledge that to the reader. Uh, I want the reader to enjoy it too. I mean, come on, like a lot of people go to the, when just go to a horror movie in the theater when we're allowed to again, you know, pay attention. People are laughing more than they're screaming, right? Yeah, I, just, I think that's, you know, it's an interesting kind of interplay between, you know, that that notion of sort of abject horror and, and you know, the gra sort of a, you know, graphic depictions or, or whatever you want to call them, right? And then on the other side of, of that same, story like right under underneath that very line is this sort of lighthearted but an airy way of dealing with it too so yeah i mean i don't want to be self-congratulatory about it but i would like to believe i'm doing something in the tradition of edgar Allan poe which is sort of you know he has an article called the imp of the perverse and that's like this kind of jester type of character that the nar that a narrator or a writer often will adopt uh, the subject position of like a dark gesture jester who laughs at death and that kind of thing or you know cackles in the face of torment and pain and so i mean that's kind of uh, i think behind my kind of writing persona a little bit yeah <clears throat> or it's so outlandish you think oh my gosh i have to laugh or else i'll be terrified <laughs> yeah well, I, I'm always cackling at my keyboard because I can't believe these things come out of my head. They're just insane sometimes. <laughs> Very disturbing. I mean, I respond to discomfort with laughter too. You know, I'm one of those types of people. Does your family worry about you and say, is <laughs> okay? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know if they worry about me or not. Where do these come from? Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. It's like, so that's, all right. <laughs> Uh, wow. Now I feel like I have to prove myself by reading something serious, but oh. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. I was saying, I, I, I think that's really a kind of a, you know, an art form of a, in, of its own right is to be able to, to balance this sort of humorous kind of, kind of work around in, in such you know, subjects where you wouldn't expect to really find the humor, you know, and, uh, and so, yeah, maybe you're onto something there with the unexpectedness of it. Uh, you know, uh, that's part of the genre. It's part of what I enjoy is a surprise moment, you know, maybe a gore where you don't expect it. Just suddenly a blade comes out of nowhere in a movie and someone's head falls back, you're like, whoa, you know, catches you, puts you back on your heels. Uh, and laughing is kind of a way of kind of making up, to the, catching up to that. 
Yeah, and you're right. It is something to balance. I think as a writer, it comes down to making sure that you haven't violated some sense of trust that your reader is putting into you to tell the story. So yes, we're making up stuff. It's all make believe and you know uh, preposterous. But there is a truth value to it. There's a value to it still. There's there's something you can trust in what the writer's doing. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I try not to violate that trust. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. That, that last piece was really fascinating though. The Catching Santa, I think it was really fascinating and, and that we have this nightmare before Christmas thing that you know, Tim Burton sort of collapses the two holidays and mixes them up and um, you know, in really interesting ways. And th this, yours takes a, a completely different route, which is you know, here's Santa of Nightmare Before Christmas, which who still has the sort of magic and sugar plums and lollipops and, hmm. and Halloween is something separate from that. You, you've blended them in a completely different way to sort of overturn the notion of Santa as who Santa was. So that was, uh, again, it's a, the surprise element is, uh, is like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, it's a short story, uh, but I, I feel like it could, it has a, a concept that could be expanded because, you know, in the story, I, I kind of, the father figure who I said before was kind of like a vampire hunter. He explains this kind of tradition of, uh, Christmas being the scariest day for vampires because it's a holy day that people believe in or at least celebrate with joy. And, <laughs> yeah. So all the vampires have to go underground and hide and wear costumes like Santa costumes to, to, to survive. <laughs> I, I want to know. I want to know about the rest of his stops on the you know on that night. <laughs> well, it, the story does have a twist ending, but I'm not going to give it away. And, and I want to know what he leaves under the tree. <laughs> Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Do we want to wrap it up? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can go ahead and wrap it up if you'd like. And uh, you know, I just want to thank you for for sort of bookending the entire day for us. That was that was generous of you, and and I think it worked well. I think, um, like I said, I mean, I think that you you're you're a significant part of this conference. You've been to you know a number in the past, and like you said, you. So you've, you've hosted it before through the university. So I think um, I think it was nice to have you here and, and it was nice to see you again and, and talk. Yeah. And um, um, let me tell everybody to 